Hello and welcome to the Wolves Report. I'm Ryan Lester and thank you for joining us for episode 95. Tonight we'll be analysing the West Ham game, the players and the match itself. We're del delighted to be joined by former FIFA and Premier League referee Keith Hackett. who will be joining us halfway through the show. Take some of your questions and look ahead to Forest. Tonight, Tyler is away scouting at Solio Moors. So tonight we've got your captain, Mark Nock, acting as director of football and as the captain. Nocky, uh, another tough afternoon at Molyneux. Probably what I would say was Wolves' best half of football in the first half for quite a while. I thought it was a good, steady control performance. But I'd love to get your take on Wolverhampton Wanderers 1, West Ham United 2. I didn't have a great deal of hope going into the game. I thought with the attacking options they had, they'd probably hurt us. But really surprised with the first half. I thought we were excellent. Um, albeit against them, maybe out of sorts. West Ham side, but I thought we controlled the play. I thought we dominated the midfield area. We, we created opportunities as opposed to chances. That would be my biggest criticism is that we didn't create too much in the way of clear-cut chances. But the the work rate was there. The the level was I thought was excellent. And um, I've, I've got no real complaints about that first half. Um, we won the penalty. So Abby has tucked it away well. So half time you, you you're relatively comfortable, but I think you know. You know they probably weren't going to be that bad in the second half and they had options to, to change the game around. And that Ing Ings and Antonio on the bench, they brought Antonio on and I thought he was the one who changed the game. Um, he gave them a real physical presence up front, a real focal point. And he, he bullied us a little bit with our back line. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't get the ball off him. He was holding it up. He was bringing the wide players in um, and it just made it a little bit of a struggle for us. I think... That, the only disappointing thing for me really was the two goals we gave away. Um, they were both really, really poor from our perspective, especially the second, which is direct from a corner. Um, and you know, we know how the game ended, and we're going to we're going to talk about that um, a little bit later on. But in terms of of what the lads did on the pitch with the options we had and what was available to us, I was I was relatively pleased with the performance. Disappointing the result, obviously, but there was a lot of positives we could take from that. Um, but predominantly the the overriding reason we didn't get that result was because a poor decision and uh, we haven't got the squad, have we? we? We can't change games the way they were able to. So, yeah, disappointed all in all. Well, absolutely. We are going to, that's why Keith's on the show later on, we're going to bring his expertise in to talk us through why that goal was disallowed, where he thinks it should or he shouldn't, um, and go through modern day officiating them and get him to answer some of your questions on that. But for me, one of the main reasons, and I know I had a bit of criticism on Twitter from that, and that's fine. Um, I talked about the squad depth again, Lucky, and we talked about how West Ham were able to bring on Antonio, um, bring on Cresswell, probably not the fastest, but he's good going forward. They brought on Johnson at right back. They gave him a lot more energy that sort of nearly fired us a bit down that side of the pitch. So they had players with experience and quality that they could bring on. We had Mateus Cunha, who is nowhere near his... his, his no is match fitness. So for me, again, although we have to look at some of the, the poor defending that led up to the goals and conceding the goal from a corner, but for me, once again, the lack of ability to react, to change to what they'd done, it was again down to squad depth. Yeah, I mean, it's no secret the season has hit the skids because we lost our front players. You know, you, you lose four players, even with a, a fully fit squad, really, and, a, and more options than we've got. If you lose four of your attacking players, you're going to struggle. But it's just the lack of options in that number nine area that, that's really hurt us. And, you know, they were able to bring Antonio on. As I said, I do think he turned the game, but they also had Danny Ings there. They had Calvin Phillips, whether wherever your feelings on him, he's an England international. He's a very experienced player. He was sat on the bench ready to come on. So we just didn't have those options, did we? And we did put a couple of the young lads on. Um, unfortunately, they're just not in a position at the moment to to affect the game or they'll work hard, they'll run around, they'll, they'll put in as much as they can. But you can't teach experience. You can't teach that that ability to, to know where to be, how to change the game. You're only going that with with a bit of time and, and experience on the pitch. So it, it's, it, it happened against Coventry. I don't think we'd have lost the game against Coventry if we hadn't have had these issues that we've got. I potentially think we could have got something against the Villa. It, it's, it is what it is. We know where we are season-wise with the squad. We know that we're, we're struggling. I just hope that it's maybe a kick at the backside for for the hierarchy. It was to know that we, we can't do this again next season because you, you're not always going to get away with it. You're not going to have that that buffer that we've had this season to, to keep you in the division. You know, if this happens at the start of the season, you can find yourself adrift. So I'm just hoping that it'll it'll ruffle a few feathers and they'll realise that, you know, we are vulnerable unless we improve the squad size. What's really frustrating me, Naki, is, is although performances haven't been great other than that first half, 
None of these games were absolutely getting hammered, pinned in and getting pumped. The most the team that's dominated Wolves the most recently is Coventry, and they were tremendous that day, and we were off it, but credit to God, they deserve to win on the day. But despite having depleted numbers and options, it always feels like Wolves are still in the game. Yeah, it, it does. I, mean, I think when you look at the squad, um, we're okay defensively, we're okay in goal, mostly. Um, we're okay in midfield, so we're not... You know, we haven't been decimated all through the all through the pitch. It's just the up front that, that that's hurt us at the moment, and that's that's where you hold the ball up. So I don't think teams are gonna are gonna rip us to pieces. I just think it's more of a we can do well defensively, we can keep the ball in midfield, and we can create opportunities. We've just got no one to finish it. And and when you doesn't matter who you're playing against, if they've got a number nine or they've got more danger from their wide areas, eventually they're gonna they're gonna pick you off and they're gonna hurt you. And that's kind of what's happening to us at the moment. And we have got Cunha back. He doesn't look even remotely fit to me. I'm not just talking match fit. He doesn't look right at all. He hasn't got that pace. He looks scared to take people on. He looks scared to really get himself into which is understandable. Which is understandable, yeah. But it's obviously it's not it's not helping us. But he had that five yard burst where he just knocked the ball and he'd run and he'd just get away from the defender and he's getting himself into space. He'd pull out wide. He'd pull into the the number ten. He dropped deep and then he burst past the defender and get himself into space. He's just not doing that at the moment, and it's understandable. But it just kind of tells you that he's he's not really. He probably shouldn't be on the pitch. It's only because of the situation we're in that that he is. Um, but I mean, for me, the season ended when when Coventry got that winner. I think that was probably it for us. And I still, I still think that's the case. But again, it's not a criticism of the players who are on the pitch, even the young lads, even anyone who's, who, you know, look, at, I've had criticisms of Sarabia, but I don't doubt that he's, he's trying for us. We've just got a lack of quality in those attacking areas and we're not going to get pumped. We're not going to get smashed by, by teams for the rest of the season other than maybe when we play Liverpool and Man City. Um, but we're just not going to have that quality to affect games in the way that we need to and, and pick out them wins. Absolutely. You are watching and listening Episode 95 of the Wolves Report with myself, Ryan Lester, and our captain, Mark Knox, shortly be joined by Keith Hackett as well to talk through those controversial, uh, that controversial goal at the end of the game. Um, we did say it was a good first half, Knocky. Um, particular highlight for me was Ryan Aitnori. nori um, Just looking ahead quickly, for me, the game changed when Aitnori went off. That bit of magic, someone that could collect the ball and take the game, win a pre-kick, take the pressure off. And... We kind of know Cunha can do that, but he's not in a position. But just highlighting Aint Norrie's performance, and we know he's good and that footwork, but another assist to win the penalty, and it was a fantastic bit of play. Yeah, we, we lost Aint Norrie and we lost Lamina, and I don't think we're in a position where we can <coughs> where we can accommodate that if we lose two more additional quality players. In terms of Aint Norrie, he's, he's getting better and better. Um, we, we said it before on, on last week's podcast, I really hope we can get him out of that wing-back position next season and get him more central because I think that there's there's a player there who's who's got a lot more to offer in attacking areas, even though he's a very good wing-back. I just think there's some there's some quality there. The ability to go past people, the, the speed, the quick feet he's got. I've, I've never seen a player at Wolves with, with feet like it. So he's improving, he's getting better and better. He's going to have some, some eyes looking at him, I think, from from some bigger clubs than us, but he's a player who's, who's starting to come to the the forefront of what we hoped he would do now. Um, and I think if, if we can move him out of that position and get him into those attacking areas, I think you're going to see an even better player next season. But he just drives forward, doesn't he? He just takes the game to the opponents. He gets you up the field. And he, he's similar to Adama in the sense that he gets you off your feet. There's not too many players that, that do that, get you excited, get you up. And he and he does it. And there was some great footwork on the lead to the penalty. He went on a couple of runs where he picked it up from the halfway line, drove forward and and they just couldn't stop him. And, you know, and there's desperation tackles coming in. He's just, he's just looking better and better. And although there's been some real positives this season and there's been some negative as well, uh, I think he's one of the biggest positives for us because he's looked absolutely exceptional wherever we've played him, and he's you know he looks happy as well, which I think is important. He's enjoying his football. Absolutely terrific footballer. I think he's got three or four goals recently and a couple of assists yeah. as well. Um, not bad for someone that wasn't good enough for Julian Lopetegui. Um, yeah. Hopefully, he's an option further up, but we don't know what the squad will look like. Um, my only concern would be then bringing in a left back, Doherty. I don't think he's a he's a, he's a long term answer to my left wing, wing back. Hugo Bueno hasn't had a lot of minutes. He's not really looked the same. Would Wolves need to bring in somebody else? Um, I don't know. But if you've got Aint Nori and he's still here for the start of next season after transfer for windows closed, it's a massive win for Wolves because when you have that talent, Noki, he's not afraid to go past anybody. He's he's marked Salah out of a couple of games, so his defensive side has improved. But going forward, I don't think if anybody dropped that little one-two with his feet past people, 
you know what's coming. They just can't stop it unless they kick him. So credit to him for getting in the position to win the penalty. Um, he had a few shots before that as well, but probably Wolves' standout performer. But um, just before we go on to the the player ratings, Noki, um, well, we'll talk about the West Ham goals as well. But I was really pleased with what the Wolves did in the first half in terms of the level of control. Now, I had an interest, I, can't, I didn't put the save the tweet, but I had an interesting tweet a few days ago, maybe yesterday, saying um, some of the fans were getting frustrated in terms of Wolves' slow build-up in the first half. I really enjoyed that because it allowed West Ham to run and run and it allowed Wolves to take their time, start again, left, right. And, we, and, and I think it worked really, really well. Doyle seemed to be in a hybrid left-hand side role, but then come collect, come deep to collect. It just worked that first half. And I think if we have the like-for-like -like changes, we go on and win that game. But for me, if if, if, if that's the amount of fitness that we've got and hopefully eight normies is okay, I think we go again, same again next week. I don't, I don't see why you change it. And I'm not really sure we'll have the options to change it either. In terms of the build-up, I've no problem with the slow build-up, especially when we haven't got that lightning pace that we had up front. It was kind of different when you had a fully fit Cunha and you had Huang or you had Neto. You had the pace to kind of get you out of it if you needed to. You can put one down the line. You know they're probably going to get on the end of it. Whereas we haven't we haven't got that luxury. We need to work our through, way through midfield. We need to, to play from the back. And I think our play out of the back was... Apart from the penalty, it was, was was pretty good. Um, we were relatively composed, and it's a different game now, isn't it? The days of just getting it to your defender and playing it to your keeper, walloping at field along on you've got to be able to play out, and you've got to be confident that you can do that. And it's going to create risks. It's going to you know cause you issues down the line. But I think it's 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 the way football's going now, um, and not having that number nine at front, it, it kind of limits what you can do anyway. So we were looking for that the runs from midfielders. We were looking for the wide players to come in. We're looking for Sarabia to come and maybe pick the ball up in the number ten and. And Lamine is coming and collect the ball and just try and work those triangles and those spaces in and around their area. And, and, and as I say, the first half, I agree with you. I think it was one of our one of our better performances of the season. Um, and I don't blame them for falling off in the second half. It was a case of we we run out of steam, perhaps, and we, we weren't able to affect the game from the bench. If we'd have been a couple of goals up, which our play in the first half probably would have deserved, it's a different game then because you've got the ability to to drop a little bit deeper control possession and, and then break in the second half but we'd never really put ourselves in that position so we, we we couldn't be comfortable we couldn't be relaxed and obviously with the changes they made they, they played their way back into the game affected it and, and took it away from us unfortunately great stuff as usual from Noki. um looking at their equalizer for the penalty is is that naive from max kilman or is it one of those when because in terms of a natural body position Noki. We've both played football to a terrible standard and you don't run with your arms next to your body. You will naturally, when you, like we saw with Joe Gomez early on in the season, uh, 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 there's no stiff human that walks around like that. His arms out. So I'm not sure if, if that goes, if he's not given in real time, it gets overturned. I think it's one of them, which is a ridiculous rule, but I'm not sure he gives that if, if it's, in, it's in play and we have to review it. What do you think? I, th I think I'd be screaming for it if it was the other way around. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I can see why he's giving it, but I don't blame Kilman for it. If you, He's moving into a defensive position. Uh, this this natural position for your arms, I don't think there is a natural position for your arms because it's going to be dictated by what you're trying to do. Whichever way you're shaping your body, where you think the cross is going to come, you, 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 your body's going to move. You're not, you know, you're not a stiff robot. You can't just go in and, and move as one. So you are going to have limbs flailing around a little bit. So I don't, I don't blame Kilman at all, not from the range of the lad hit it from. Um, but he was he was right in front of me, and you could see as soon as he did it, it was going to be a penalty. And it's one that VAR, I think, I know you said maybe they don't overturn it. I think they may well have done. Asked him to go and have a look at that because he just looked he looked pretty pretty clear cut for me. But I don't blame Kilmer in the slightest. No. I do blame Doherty and Totty because it was we were overplaying. It was a poor pass from Doherty. Totty doesn't get on. Right, it, in trouble. It, it runs loose. So shut it off at source. Don't put yourself in that position because as soon as we get the ball away and they break through, it's panic stations then, isn't it? So we, we put ourselves in trouble. But in terms of Kilman, I, I don't blame him for that, but I do think it was a penalty, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. And there's, I think there's a fine line between playing out regardless and no offence to Toti and Doherty, but they're not the two players I want on the ball when you're under pressure playing out from the back. Now, Toti's defended brilliantly. He's probably one of the weaker on the ball out of uh, at the defenders, though. I want him defending, not playing out. Um, although he's, he's, he's done okay. I think sometimes you have to take your medicine and if you can't be 100% you're going to make that pass. You just hit a ball, a percentage ball down the line or a cross field pass. Um, so, but it's risk and reward football, isn't it? You're trying to outplay the press and get through and if you do, you're in a great position. So, um, 
no real criticism. I just think sometimes you have to be smarter in those decisions and swallow your pride and just clear it instead of trying to play it out. Um, the West Ham second goal knocky. Um, don't know how I feel about this. I know it was really windy um, and it was one of the best dead ball specialists in European football. There's no doubt about it. But can, can we forgive? Any, is it forgivable that he can? I mean, he's absolutely. I mean, Wall Price loves scoring at the North Bank. He scored that goal from somewhere in the South Bank car park a couple of years ago yeah, when he stumped one in and he's whipped one in. His delivery of the ball is as good as it gets. But if, if we're being picky, Antonio clearly bums, drops a bum into the player. I'm not giving that as a free kick, by the way. No. Um, because that's a natural challenge of players coming together. And I think you're allowed to sort of work your space. I do think, though, we should be doing better. It's, I think there's there's a mix of things, isn't it? I mean, it was, I don't want to use the wind as an excuse, um, but it, it was a, you know, the weather was all over the place, but I just don't think your keeper should be beaten from a corner, not at this level. I mean, yes, he's hit it well, but it's not landed in the top corner as it. it's landed sort of halfway down the net. Um, I'm, I'm probably a little bit old fashioned. I still think we should be having players on the post because I think most of the goals you see from corners now, they're not smashed into the net, they're, they're bobble into the into the unguarded side of the net. So for me, I'd still have somebody on there. We did have someone come back, but if you're not starting in that position, then you're not going to be in a position to clear the ball because you're chasing it into the net. So it, it's a really poor goal, as well as he's hit it. I mean, if it was one of our players who scored, that I'd be absolutely delighted. But I don't think any player at, at any kind of high level should be conceding a goal from, from a corner. It's almost like, it felt like it's gone in the middle of the goal as well and Sar's got caught in no yeah. man's land. Yeah, he's, he's, I mean, he's, he's not in the worst position in the world that you'd expect a keeper to be in, but he, he kind of seems to jump, but he jumps under the ball. Um, I don't know whether he feels like he's in trouble and he's trying to make it look like Antonio has fouled him because he doesn't jump up. He kind of jumps like a, a kind of horizontal level. It was really strange kind of... Yeah, it's almost a, dis a distraction. It's one of those gestures when you jump to put the yeah. opposition off when he's not trying to win. And it worked. Um, and it, it did work, yeah. But I mean, it, yes, it's a good hit. Yes, Wal Prowse is an absolutely superb dead ball specialist. Premier League, this is the Premier League. You don't get beat from a corner. It just shouldn't happen. You don't really see many of them. I think uh, Douglas Dewey scored one maybe earlier in the season. Did he score one yeah. or two? But um, I can see uh, Keith Hackett waiting patiently in the green room, looking forward to getting him on. So, Noki, let's go quickly through the player ratings before we get Keith on and have a chat about that controversial decision and officiating in the Premier League. Um, we talked about Jose Sala and Noki. Um, the main disappointment is I think he gets stuck, stuck under that. Otherwise... He was okay, but Noki, um, just talk me through the back three. Um, they, they, they were okay, but kill a mistake defensively to give away the penalty. I thought Kilman was okay. He should have had himself a goal. Um, Totti was okay. They were all okay. There was no, we know, we didn't get ripped to pieces. I think the only time they struggled was when Antonio came on and he, he kind of, he doesn't run in behind, but he, he, he backs into the defender and he's such a big lad, he kind of, pushes players back out of position, makes it really uncomfortable for you. So I don't think they did they did a great deal wrong, but it's those it's those big moments that are letting us down at the moment and we gave a silly goal away. So as solid as they were for most of the game, it, it cost us the game defensively. And the midfield pairing, probably Wolves' strongest pairing again, um, Mario Lamina and Joe Gomez. Yeah, solid. Um, I thought they were the main engine behind our, our play in the first half, control possession well, move the ball well. They're just a better, a, a, they're better when they're playing with each other. You know, they don't look the same when Doyle drops in there. And Doyle's a good player, but we lose something when he's in that position as opposed to Lamina or Gomez. So I thought they were pretty good. They were pretty solid. Um, and we definitely felt it when Lamina went off. We lost a, a real element of control in that midfield area. Yeah, he, uh, Mario had played a lot of minis recently. And for yeah. someone that had, had, had been catching up with his football because he'd had some time away, um, yeah, I just, I just, you could see the guy's been, he's been on empty for a few weeks. Um, yeah, don't blame oh, him checking him off at all because the last thing we want now is got, to be another player. It's Wolves' most right decision. influential player this season. I think we yeah, have to keep him, in, keep, keep, protect him. Um, me, I'll do Tommy Doyle. I thought Tommy was was decent. Um, you can see he hasn't really got a lot of place pace on that left hand side, but he was re that first half. He was really busy. He was collecting. He was getting into good positions, and I think he did okay. I would say. He's better in that wide left position um, than, say, Mario is. And I think going to, I'd be comfortable, although Doyle's not going to 
set the world on fire in terms of beating a man. He does have that quality, and I thought he was quite mobile and did okay. Um, talk us through uh, the wing backs, Knocker. Yeah, and, and Chilo says, look, by the way, Knocky's not moaned yet. So can you do some moaning now, Knocky, and make up for Tyler? I've, I've got to watch him. He starts slagging the team off on Twitter. I don't like that. Um, <laughs> I, I thought, again, relatively solid, uh, especially Samedo. I, I really like Samedo. I think he's been, I th- for me, he's probably our player of the season. I know he's not going to get that award because you've got your eight Norris and, and players like that who've, who've come through. But I just think there's something about him I really like. Um, and I think he's improved this season. He, he was absolutely solid. So no real issues from those positions. Um relatively solid on both flanks, I'd say. And again, as good as West Ham probably were in the second half in terms of their improvement, I never felt... In, I felt they could score, but I never felt like they were imminently going to because I felt we had a, an element of control. So, yeah, no no problems in those positions. I thought they both played well. Excellent. Um, I'm going to move on to Aint Nori and I'll leave Pablo Sarabia for you because I know you love talking about his stats. Um, for the time he was on the pitch, I thought Aint Nori was the best player on the pitch comfortably beating his people, creating crossfield passes, beating a man. You look like a, a seasoned Premier League forward. And that tells us about how much talent he's got. We're talking about a team in a quarterfinal of a, a, Europe, a European competition, European champions, and he had them on toast first half. And considering it, it was at the end of Ramadan and he's not going to have a lot of energy, massive respect for Ryan Aitnori, yeah. really, tremendous performance. Um, and last but not least, talk me through Pablo Sarabia. Uh, I, I thought he struggled up to the penalty um, and then he took the penalty really well. Um, after that, I felt that he he, he he improved definitely. He seemed to get his confidence up and he seemed to, to play some decent football after that. Um, yeah, it, I, again, I don't think he did anything wrong, um, but he, he was a little bit slow to get into the game. But after he scored the goal, he, he seemed to be a little bit more, a little bit more his old self then. Absolutely. Uh, we're at that part of the show and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, I've been talking to Keith uh, via various social media platforms and finally got him on the show. Delighted to welcome Keith Hackett, former FIFA Premier League referee. Keith, good evening and thank you for giving up some of your Tuesday evening to join the show. Uh, pleasure. Good to be on. Thank you very much. Keith, straight to business. Um, Wolves disallowed, disallowed goal in the in the last minute. Now, I've, I'm very much gold and black. So is Noki. We love our football team. I'm struggling to understand how that's disallowed. Now, the black and white letters of the law, I can see that you would interpret that as potentially offside. But Keith, oh, please, your take on, on that goal that wasn't. Uh, the first thing is that I don't like to see goals ruled out. There's got to be a reason and a good reason why you rule a goal out. So let us look at the law because that's where that's the basis of which referees operate on. A player and your forward was in an offside position. That's clear. But being in an offside position is not an offence. It's not an offence to be in an offside position. You only you only penalise that player if he's active, and in this case is interfered with the opponent. And that judgment has to be, where did the shot come from? What was the speed of that shot? And it entered the goal. We know it entered the goal. So to take you out of your misery, (laughs) I generally believe that was a good goal. And I could not see in law why it should be ruled out. Let me give you the reason being why I think there's been a lot of controversy and discussion around this, Um, because I think it's a wider issue than just the law, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So the law itself says, is that player interfering with with the opponent? So is your forward interfering with the goalkeeper? Was he obstructing the goalkeeper? No. It was, it was about a metre in front of the goalkeeper. So this space. There's space for the goalkeeper to move. That's clear. You know, we saw a few weeks ago, I saw a few weeks ago, you probably did, a goal being allowed when the Burnley goalkeeper, not necessarily in your game, was being held 
and prevented from moving. And the PGMOL allowed that goal, the referee did, and didn't, co didn't come back and say the referee had got it wrong. So the law says interfering with an opponent from playing, so he can't play the ball, can he? Yes, he can. Or being able to play the ball by clearly obstructing the opponent's line of vision. Now, let's look at this line of vision, because that is, the, if you like, the area where you can have a debate. Now, some years ago, when this law was changed, I was the boss of the PGMOL, and I went back to IFAB, the lawmakers, to ask for some degree of clarification, because I wanted to know at what point a, a player would be penalised in terms of the vision. And they, they were quite clear. They said, think of a flight path of the ball heading over the head of the attacker that's in an offside position and the goalkeeper who's behind it. So it's almost the ball travelling directly at the goalkeeper. That wasn't the case. In this instance, the ball was clearly going to the right-hand corner of the goal. And I'll tell you, I don't care whether he's number one world-class goalkeeper in the world, he was not saving no. That, no. that ball. So this was a decision that worried me. A decision and that I was concerned that the PGMOL came out to justify it in the way that they justified it. Why? Because there were other decisions over the weekend that they didn't come out and talk about. Was that because they were nervous around what was being said and what is being done? Referees are human. They will make mistakes. The one, way, the one thing when I was boss of the PGMOL was I would say, admit to your error. If you admit to your mistake and you analyse that decision this week as a group of referees, then going forward, you're going to improve your decision-making process. So he's not interfering with the goalkeeper. He's not in the sight, line of sight. Therefore, that goal should have stood. So now let's move the other way because the referee didn't rule it out initially. Well, this is the painful thing, Keith, isn't it? Because the for, for me, are we looking for, the only way you go to VAR is for a clear and obvious error. And it's, yeah. it, I don't think it's clear and obvious. So you, you'll know more than me. That, well, it, the tr it's not clear and obvious. You know, um, and, and therefore, the goal should have, been, should have been allowed. But what you've got here is you had the referee relatively inexperienced. Uh, he's only had seven games this season in the Premier League when the likes of people like Taylor have had 22. You know, even the VAR has had 18 against the referees, seven. Had that referee, I think, been stronger, is he in a position to, to go to the screen and say, I'm sticking with my decision? I'm Do happy. Do you, do you think, Keith, there's, there's a reluctance to go against the VAR when you go to the monitor? Because as fans now, if you see an official go to the monitor, I don't recall ever them sticking with their on-field decision. I almost feel it's inevitable now that if you're recommended to go to the screen, it's 99% nailed on that they're going to change their mind. What VAR has done, look... I'm for technology. I'll keep repeating that I'm for technology. I introduced, when I was boss of the PGMOL, the, the communication kits because I, I felt that would improve the standard of decision-making through better communication. And that three, three match officials looking at it, a decision, they've come to the right call. I also went to the Premier League after the ball had been dropped by Roy Carroll at Old Trafford when they were playing Manchester... Uh, when Manchester United were playing Spurs, and I stood up there and they thought I'd come off a planet when I said, look, I want to introduce goal line technology. I work with Orkai. Around each goal is seven cameras operating at 500 frames per second, and the referee's not involved in that process at all. 
if you take the human element out of anything, it works better. You know, going to your part of the world where cars used to be manufactured and they use robotics, they can use robotics 24 hours a day. I can argue the technical aspect. What we've got with VAR is, first of all, we've got a flawed offside mechanism, technically. I talked about 500 frames per second. Just to judge a ball over the line, the whole of the ball. When we're talking about offside, we're looking at the at the point the ball is kicked or moved forward, and also the, the delivery area. So there is a degree of inaccuracy that comes from determining the position because of the process of the ball, the point at which the ball is played. In this case, that player's offside. There's no if some buts is in an offside position. The system, if they were using the semi-automated system, which is AI and own independent cameras, not broadcast cameras, you're going to get a quicker and you're going to get a more accurate decision. That's the first point. But you're going to get it quicker. If that speed of decision comes through quicker, then the whole process is speeding up. And I believe the accuracy will come from it through the confidence. The real problem for me is that I don't think that you can referee one day and be the VAR next. Would I ask your top player, <coughs> would your manager say, look, I want you to play Saturday afternoon at 12.30. And by the way, be down in middle six uh, the following day to play again. We've only got 11 players, Keith. They can't, we can't even do oh, that. <laughs> but the, the point I'm making is that I don't think it's conducive to good decision-making to have two games in a weekend, whatever you're doing. Uh, because at the elite level, it's, it's not just the physical side. <clears throat> it's also the mental side, recovery. Not taking baggage into a game. So the first thing is, I am continually saying that, that you need an independent panel of VAR operators. By the way, I'm not looking like for a, a job. Like a, like a specialist, <clears throat> so, someone who specialises in that specifically and not, not officiating. Well, look, they keep telling me, everybody in refereeing around the world, keep telling me that the World Cup was the place where it operated the best. Why? Because they had a specialist panel of VAR operators. They might have been referees from around the world, but when they arrived at the venue, they went into a, a, a weekly, well, a daily session to improve their performances, and the best were then selected to perform in, at the World Cup. So they specialise in that situation, you know, and therefore, as a result of that, that's the only job they should do. Just like an assistant referee, at the elite level, that's the only job they should do. Because like a good golfer, the more you play, ideally, the better you become. Like any good sportsman, they'll tell you it's about body mechanics, it's about natural thing. So I'm not trying to confuse your listeners. What I'm saying is that what VAR has done is coming and it's created lazy officiating. And I use an analogy that I learned from Nigel Owens, the rugby union referee, who well, I admire and watch. And, and of course, I look carefully at how rugby union do it, and I'm thinking, why don't we adopt the same sort of process? Involve the fans. Is there any reason why we don't involve the fans? No, what we want to do is treat fans like monkeys. You know, they, they don't want to. Uh, involve them in the process. All you've got to do is be transparent, listen into the conversation, and you'll be able to then determine with a little bit more credibility the outcome, even though it might be wrong. So the analogy is this. If you think of a tightrope walker and he's going to walk between two towers, no net, Everything he does, his next step is with care, with thought, 
and with caution and a, and a greater understanding because it's him and it's him that's, or her that's going to be doing the decision-making of that next step, making judgment on the wind. Put a safety net under, almost like you're watching at a circus. If you just you fall off that safety net, off the off the the, the tightrope, you've got something to catch you. What I've seen is VAR has become the safety net. Referees, instead of making you know the process of a decision from a referee is to see recognize, think, and act. So if we look at that referee, and this is why we have VAR, he's not going to see everything. He's only got, if you like, a two-dimensional view, what he's looking at. And therefore, can he judge whether a player's offside or not? That, that He might have an indication. He's looking at his assistant referee, and I'm thinking, where's the assistant referee in this? Did he flag? I don't know. But I'd ask that question of the individual. So now what he's done is the guy, uh, everybody's accepted it's a goal. <laughs> that's that If you look at the player's reaction. It, well, you could say there was. there was Everybody's it, saying that's it. The goalkeeper's. Yeah, every, done, well, you know, me and Nokia celebrating in the North Bank. The, so you've got. It's, yeah. You've got all the tr transmission coming into you to filter a decision. And you're right. When you go to the screen, this is the lazy bit. And the lazy bit, my mate's going to take the can, not me. Yeah, it's... it's. Why do you think, Keith? Um, why do you think they're so reluctant now in terms of, you know, the semi-automated offside um, that was... I think they used that... Correct me if I'm wrong, they used that at the Euros or the World Cup and they used it well. VAR was brilliant at the World Cup. Nokia, I'm sure you agree that... I know Nokia's very much anti-VAR because of the experience we're having now. Um, why do you think there is a, re a reluctancy for the lack of transparency for fans to see and hear uh, what's actually going on? Well, that's not down to the Premier League or the PGMOL. That is the IFAB. The, they're, the governing, they're the governing body. They're the lawmakers. And they set the scene. And therefore, in that sense, they set the criteria of operation, what can and cannot be, be, be said or done. And that, that, for me, is where the basic foundation of the problem is. Now, look, I, in the past, when I was boss of the PGMOL, we had law amendments, and I would go back to the IFAB and say, you know, what's the correct interpretation here? Have you thought about this? But, but I think that what we've got now is we, we, we've not got... We've got the confusion coming out of I, IFAB um, by way of law changes that they've made that have tried to be tighten up the law, but in fact have confused more. I'm not just talking about offside. You know, we can get into deliberate play and and that, you know, that scenario. You can get into handball and what is handball. All these things are confusing and making life more difficult for our referees. I mean at grassroots level, it becomes even more difficult because they are sitting there watching the senior colleagues who ought to be setting the, the example, um, and they're not. And, of course, then when you've got the, the PGMOL through Dermot Gallagher uh, trying to justify the decision at times, then, you know, that worries me because that's not transparent. Now, they'll have a go at me. They don't like me because... I, I've always been the same. You know, I've come out of grounds where there's been a decision and, and you know, and I've, I'm, I don't even know what they're talking about. I've gone, what? Because I've not seen it. I've got, I've taken the guy's phone number and said, right, I'll ring you back. I'll have a look at match of the day tonight and I'll see. And I've had those conversations. The game has to be transparent. What's worrying me now? And I want to allay any fears because what, we, what we're getting now is that the errors that are coming through 
are actually putting at risk the integrity of the match officials because fans believe that they're cheating. They're not. I mean, I, I used to walk out the, out the grounds and they used to say, what's the score then? I wouldn't even know. I was so intense because it's not about, it's about the next decision and the next one you need to get right. The ones that have gone, have gone. Does it make you sad? I mean, Wolves have been on the end of a lot of interesting decisions this season. Opening game of the season, Anana comes across, Sasha Kalajic catches oh. him in the face, no penalty. There's been handballs, there's been all kinds of things this season. But with my opinion, the drop in the standard of the officiating, does it make you sad when you, when you see people calling them cheats? Yeah. It makes me really sad because if anybody doesn't believe that when Mike Riley took over from me, you know, um, and by the way, I retired. I, I retired because around me, I had a group of referees that were somewhat criticised, in fairness. We never got it 100%. But in 10 games, we might make one error. And we really, then, I pick the phone up, speak to the manager, explain what's gone off, have the referees in, discuss with the referees so that we avoid it. So I think we did have a cadre of world-class referees. Um, and we didn't get there easily. I mean, that was through me having to say, right, you, you've gone. You, you dropped, you know. And that's not easy when they're colleagues, but just like a sales force that I used to manage, if the salesman didn't get me the sales I required, they would have operational advice. I'd put everything into that individual to maintain his employment. If he wasn't good enough, he would have to go. Now, what we had, and look, you've read what I've been writing for a number of years now. There is no doubt that Mike Riley uh, started the decline. And it was it's almost started in the opening weeks of his regime in charge. One of the first actions he did was decided to have a clear out of the coaching staff that I'd put in place. Those guys were honest and they'd tell me about the performance of a referee and they would tell the referee. You had people like Paul Durkin, Roger Dilks, uh, Trevor Simpson. They were coaches, referee coaches, former referees of a high standard, communicating well, understanding what re referees require, and putting a hand in the back. You know, so if you if you look at the standard of refereeing, then you look at individuals and you say to, you know, I look and I think, how can I do it? How can I do an analogy of it? Look, there are players that are good players, but they're not good enough for the Premier League. You've seen that. You've seen some of your players move on because they can't cope with the Premier League. The Premier League is, is the Premier League in the world. There's no question about that. The exposure of referees is without doubt because they've got 22 cameras following their every move. But what we've had is 10 years of decline under Riley. And I can't believe. I'm telling you, if Richard Scudamore, he retired, he would, and he appointed Riley. And I, and I, you know, at the end of the day, you point, appoint someone and if it doesn't work, you have to offload them. And football is a cruel business. If you're not scoring goals and with a number nine on your back, right, you're not picked for the team. And that should be exactly the same. And Howard Webb should be the 21st manager of the Premier League. Now, I thought... You know, I've been in a position where I've left companies and joined new companies. And the first thing you do is you review everything. You review the staff, you review administration, you re review all the operation. 
in a way, I'm disappointed because I don't think that's what Howard Webb has done. From, from two years ago, I was saying, what's John Moss doing? Effectively managing the Premier League referees. This, uh, this uh, being kind to him, he was adequate just as a referee on the Premier League. I didn't see him as a star performer. I didn't see him setting the example. And as a result, I think there's been a malaise. There's definitely been a decline. There's, there's people like, um, in a way, Oliver and, and Taylor to some extent, although I worry about Taylor, although I thought at the weekend he did reasonably well. I think those yeah. are the two best refs, to be honest, you've mentioned there. I think Taylor well, and Oliver are all well, the clear standouts. They are, but they're, they're not as good as some of the referees that I've seen. You know, I used to measure our referees against Pierre Luigi Colina. High standard, sir. Uh, decision making, levels of performance. So, you know, if you get into the technical aspect of a referee, my expectation was he would he would have to run a minimum of eleven and a half thousand meters in a game, and a minimum thousand meters at seven meters a second. And I would be looking for them to do 50, an average of 50 sprints in a game. Yes, I had all that data. And that data said, is that, guy, is that referee in form? Is, he, is it a fitness point of view in terms of decision making? I've, I've seen some woeful referee. I've seen better referees refereeing my own team, Peniston Church in the Northern <laughs> County of East League. <laughs> and, and I... And I you know, if, if we look at if we look at Anthony Taylor, I watched him on Sat on at uh, the weekend, right? Um, and rather than throwing cards around like confetti, he held them back, and he he started communicating more, uh, uh, understanding the difficulties and the speed of the game, the, the the sort of impression. But see, when I stood up at the PGMOL in the first few weeks of taking the job on, I said the average cards had to come down. They had to be around about three per game. Um, and they laughed at me, but I was operating in Europe and I was, you know, I was advising Germany and, and other countries about refereeing. And if we took at that time, Germany had, uh, they're, they were averaging five yellow cards a game and 145 red cards in that season. And I was advising them about proactive management, not reactive management, and how you, you needed to have a step management scenario. There are certain referees, Oli, uh, Taylor is one, is averaging over five, Darren England worries me because he leads with a yellow card, even if nothing is said or done. We've seen, we've seen things like that a few times this season, Keith. I mean, yeah, I, there's, there's, it, that, there's that many. I, I couldn't pick them off, but we've seen some. I mean, Mario Lamina got sent off for walking towards the referee and he was the third man out. I think that was last season, Knocker. He got sent yeah, off at Southampton. I don't know if you remember that. And like, I, I don't, we all assumed he must have said something terrible to the referee. But he was walking over and he got sent off. It was crazy. Um, so how do we how do we fix it, Keith? I mean, you've spoken really well there about transparency and about the lack of communication between players mm -hmm. and referees, which I think he's he's very clear to see from the stands. But I'm I'm not an advocate of VAR. I'm not a big fan of it. But I want to be one round. So how, what do we do now to make VAR better? How do we make it work for the supporters well, and for the PGMOL? Well, first of all, we've got to improve the standard of referee. That's the first bit. Uh, We've got to have a definite independent panel of VAR specialists. That's for certain. We have then got to go to the IFAB and say, as the leading competition in the world in terms of a league, we want the big screen and we want the referee and the two assistants to come together and we want to follow the same process that we see in Rugby Union. 
let us involve the fans so they can see what the process is and they then don't they're not standing around knowing that when that VAR sign goes up for a, a review whatever he thinks in the Stockley Park it, the referee's going to go with so I'm going to I'm saying this leadership guidance has to come into refereeing Howard Webb has to be stronger with them and he might well be doing that now because we've got to have independence where that guy is the referee and he goes to the monitor and I'm almost want the VAR to say as least amount of possible because it's very easy isn't it this is a penalty kick and it's a trip come and have a look the statement is conditioning the referee. Yeah. You know, and therefore what you want is you want, I think at that point, the communication goes off. It doesn't need a conversation with the other guy in the in the That's in the right point thing. Just you make the decision and, and have the pair to actually make it and come away. Because you know what you don't want is a referee on a Monday sitting there thinking, I've looked at it now and crikey, look at, look at the decision or the outcome. And, and, I, and then I think it let's, let's take this old scenario of this offside uh, scenario. They've got to look at that. I don't, they shouldn't precondition. They need to examine it in more detail. Look at the direction of the ball. Think about moving away from the goalkeeper, another scenario where the player is in the same position offside, further, slightly further up in the penalty area. Let's ignore the goalkeeper at this point. He's still on the field of play and he's still there. And the ball goes to the inside left, who scores. You don't pull him off. If the, the number nine's in an offside position, he doesn't no longer in law gets called. So I think that here, the definition that they should give to their referees is if the ball is not in the flight path, and that might be what you do is you say, look, let's think of a, 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 a band of chalk a, a meter wide direction of the ball. Does it hit the goalkeeper, that white line? Or the forward. In this occasion, it didn't. It went to the left. So this is no different to the scenario, in my opinion, where the ball goes out to the left winger and the number nine's offside. We don't pull the number nine anymore. Keith, do you think... Great answer again. I mean, I wish this was a two-hour show because I've got about a 1,000 questions I could ask you and people are loving it. So this is episode 95 of the Wolves Report with former FIFA and Premier League referee Keith Hackett, club captain Mark Nock and your host Ryan Lester. Keith, um, obviously it's a great answer from, from Nocky's question, but is, I don't, I don't like asking this question, but you hear I'm going to ask, is, is there a reluctancy then, do you think? For me, it feels like there's a lot of backing up your colleagues as opposed to making your own decision. Um, and I kind of understand. I kind of understand that I back my workmates up. But when you're in a position of authority for a game like that, do you think that occurs? Is there too much of it, or do you or do you believe there's enough independence? Think about football, and who gets the glory? The guy who puts the ball in the back of the net, and in a sense, he takes the credit for everything that's going off. What the ref what the referee has to be is the is as law five, the decision maker. You know, I wouldn't want to come away from a game listening to the debate and discussion that's going off uh, without having a, a degree of responsibility. And the responsibility of the referee is he carries the cap. He is the team leader. And I tell you, I would be beside myself when I looked at that outcome 
And yeah, I can, you know, I get hammered by other referees who talk about the subjectivity around this decision. Well, referees don't operate on subjectivity. They work and operate on decisions. Make a decision and justify it. And I think if they look at the law on this, they can't justify it. Because I don't think the sight line of the goalkeeper on this occasion was obstructed. And therefore, as, as a result, you can't pull that player up for being in an offside position. Neither did he obstruct the goalkeeper. So the scenario is that we've got to get referees back to refereeing. And we've got to actually improve the standard of referee. So if we if we look at the likes of Taylor, how how do we compare to how would you compare Anthony Taylor with Kalina? He's not there, is he? No, but you probably are picking the best referee we've ever no, seen. I, no well, offense, Case. <laughs> well, well, listen, listen. If you are manufacturing motor cars, what you do is you look at the competition. And you make your car look as good as, operate as good as the, the sort of competition. And therefore, how close can you get Taylor to operating like Kalina? Now, he's partway there. Look at, Ante, look at Michael Oliver, again, a very experienced referee, who, in my opinion, is not suited to the VAR role at all given one or two decisions this year. I can't go into detail on them, but they're in, in instances where I think he let his referee down. And I can judge that technically. But see, I think Oliver has not fulfilled, like Taylor, their full potential. And then I'd be saying to the other referees, how close can you get to him? I used to say this to Webb. I used to say this to Clattenburg. I used to say to Halsey, when we talk about 11,500 metres in a game, by the way, Halsey used to do 14,000 metres a game. When we look at Webb and how Webb advanced, Kalina, penalty area to penalty area, box to box, could do that in 11 seconds. Webb could do that in 11 seconds, comfortably. So... When you have those measurements as the boss of the referees, then that's how you start to measure the basics of the, of the referee. You know, we, we move from uh, being referees who, when we moved into the professional environment, that's why we brought sports science in, sports psychologists, to measure what, what players were getting and we needed an improvement in standards. I just, I just feel that um, we've a long way to go. Keith, I, I want you to come on another episode because the people listening are thoroughly enjoying it. Me and Noki are just this. This has been fantastic, and it's it's been worth the wait. Um, and two people have said, "Are you free to referee Walls and Forest on Saturday afternoon? Can you uh, put the boots on, put the boots on one last time for us?" Well, I'm recovering from a fall. Um, I got tripped at a football match on Saturday, which I wasn't playing, I wasn't refereeing, which is uh, unsurprising. But I, I think generally um, we've just got to get referees to be a bit better. They've got Craig Pawson on Saturday. Now, let me tell you about Pawson, because Pawson was a better referee three, four years ago than now, because he suffers at times with VAR. Like, he gets to the penalty area, an offence takes place, and he hesitates. Now, he didn't do that in the past. And he's, he's got, he's, you know, I think he's becoming more confident. Look, he's got the experience. Uh, hopefully, he'll do well. And he's also got the one referee who has actually gone to the screen as the referee this season and said to the VAR, I'll get lost, I'm staying with my decision. And that's Andy Madley. But who knows? Yeah, you're not feeling me much confidence ahead of Saturday. It's a hard enough game as it is, Keith. But um, Keith, thank you. And I know Noki shares this as well. This has been a brilliant 
time to have you on the show. Uh, thank you so much for your explanation and your honesty. I really, really appreciate it. And as so many have asked, and me and Noki will echo this as well, please come on again. Maybe when we've had some more controversy and you can talk us through. Just one last thing, Keith. Um, yeah. The other guy that's usually on the show, Tyler, um, he was the mascot when you refereed, refereed at Wolves, I think in the late 80s, early 90s, and he's still got the 50 pence piece that you give him. He's so You're tight, kidding. he's still not spent it. No, he's still got it. <laughs> and just, he's, he's, not, he's not spent it, but um, I'm Amazing. sure from the comments, everyone's saying, <clears throat> thank you so much. It's been brilliant to have you on the show, Keith. Keith, I want to Pleasure. drop me a message. I'd love a conversation with you off air as well. Right. Thank you so much. Keith right. Hackett, form of, head of the Premier, Premier League referee. Thanks, Keith. Fantastic. Cheers, Keith. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Wow, Noki. How I'm not, I'm not following that. Just wrap the show up, mate. It's, there's, there's no way to follow that. Wow. Uh, Honestly, you... that was that was that was <clears> absolutely <throat> incredible. Guys, um, I can see Duncan, Andy, Hungry Like the Wolf. There's so many positive comments comments coming through from Keith. That is um absolutely fascinating. I mean I think the, the key to that, and I think what, what everyone probably appreciates, and, and me personally what I appreciate was the honesty, was that he he knows it wasn't it, even when he was in charge of the whole system, he knows it wasn't perfect, but he was striving for perfection. There's nothing wrong with that. So we've lost that transparency element. We've lost the trust element that, that someone like a Keith Hackett would give us. So yeah, unbelievable insight. That was uh, that was fantastic. We should have just done the whole show. We're just letting Keith talk us through it. Should, honestly, it would have been better than talking about the West Ham. Three questions, and he's just my brain. He's just like loving what he's saying the whole way through. That was incredible. Noki, we need to get him on again. Um, yeah. Hopefully, though, um, well, I'm sure it will happen. There'll be some crazy decision about a Wolves player wearing a sock the wrong way around and he gets booked for it or something. <laughs> who, who knows? Um, let's move away from the expertise of Keith Hackett and to the amateurish behaviour of Mark Knock and Ryan Lester. <laughs> Saturday afternoon, um, Wolves head to the city ground to face Nottingham Forest. Wolves very much depleted. Forest in a bad run of form. Um, Return of Gibbs White, Nuno, Willie Bolly. Lots of drama. I'm doing a Forest podcast tomorrow afternoon. The, the guy on there wants to know why the, there's the needle between the two clubs. I think we've agreed earlier on, Noki. Um, same lineup again if Ain't Norrie's fit. Maybe a few more minutes for Cunha. But I'm really looking forward to this game because of the needle. And I think that gives. I think it makes it more fun because, for whatever reason, there is that little bit more spice, as Chris Eubank says. Yeah, I, th I think this, the the needle has come into it because of the Gibbs White deal. Um, we kind of thought they paid too much. They feel like they've got a bargain. I think that the overriding thing is it was absolutely the right deal for Wolves. It was the right deal for Forrest and it was the right deal for Gibbs White. So everyone got out of it what they needed, you know. And, and if they do go down, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a, some very big fish coming in for Gibbs White. So it, it's worked for everybody involved. Look, Forrest are an absolutely massive club. They've got incredible support. It's a, it's a proper old-fashioned ground to go to. But from our perspective, we need to start picking up points again to, to stop the season from, from falling off a cliff. So it's going to be a difficult game. Um, they've got some dangerous attacking players. Gibbs White in particular the spring to mind, Chris Wood, who, when not he's not in form, he's capable of scoring three goals against Wolves. So the fact that he's in form has got to put a little bit of a, a concern to us. But um, I think if we can, if we set up the same letter that we did against West Ham, keep the shape, stay disciplined defensively, keep the ball in midfield. Um, I expect them to come at us a lot more than West Ham did in that first half. That. So, yeah, there'll be spacing behind for us to run into. Uh, maybe keep it tight, make sure we're in the game on on sort of 60 minutes, get Cunha on and see if we can if we can impact the game. But it's going to be a difficult game for us. Yeah, it's going to be a tough game. Um, as you both predicted, you said the season would peter out. I'm frustrated because I don't think we've been hammered by anybody or out of games and just feels like the, I know I keep saying it, but the squad depth has really caught up with us. As you said earlier on, I hope those, the custodians in the foot, who make the footballing decisions can rectify that in the summer. Uh, Wolves should have some minutes to spend because you'd imagine there's going to be some big offers coming in for these players, whether that's Kilman, whether that's Drow Gomez, whether it's Ain't Nori. It, I think it's going to be a busy summer, um, but it needs to be a busy summer to, to give, yeah. give Wolves probably 19, 20, 21 players as opposed to 14, 15, 16, which we, which, which we seem to have. Um, I'd like to take credit for this episode, Noki, but Keith Hackett has, has absolutely given us a masterclass in officiating and I hope everyone enjoyed that. I certainly did. I hope we can get him on again. Um, so let's end the show with some more amateurish behaviour and go to our predictions. Mark Knock, Nottingham Forest v Wolverhampton Wanderers. Um, I'm good for a 1-1 draw. Uh, I think... 
I think Chris Wood opens a score in the pace of Alanga worries me. I think it will be down to the byline crossing. Chris Wood 1 0. And I think we will level it. And I think it'll be Cunha's first goal since returning. And you can tell me my prediction, please. Yours will be 1 0, Cunha. Absolutely. This has been episode 95 of the Wolves Report. Thank you so much to our club captain, Mark Nock. Thank you so much to Keith Hackett. It was absolutely incredible, honest and educational for us as well. Fantastic. I've been your host, Ryan Lester. Look forward to coming back next week when Wolves will beat Forest 1-0. <laughs> Love the Wolves. <laughs>